Well, while we're talking about different types of worlds and things that look different, Adrian Martinez from Houston says, my question is, is it possible for a planet to naturally form in a donut shape, like a torus? And if not, what are the weirdest or most unusual planet shapes we've discovered in the universe so far? Do we even do we even know? <laughs> do we even know the shapes of a lot of these planets? Because a lot of the time you're just going on mass, aren't you? Or can you see a shape I even? I don't know. So that's a good question, Adrian. I don't think it's possible to form a donut planet. You know, Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems hard with gravity concentrating everything. And, you know, the easiest shape to be is round because it pulls everything in nice yeah, and Yeah, I, I wrote an essay back when we opened the Rose Center for Earth and Space because in the middle of this facility is a round thing. Okay, uh -huh. <laughs> there's a sphere. So I wrote an essay called On Being Round. <laughs> And it was all about how nature just wants to make things round. And when it's not round, there's a really interesting reason why it's not round. But I, I don't think we ever get anything a donut because the gravity wants to put it all in one place. And it wants to put it in the middle. In and the middle, exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say, though, there is, though, a really cool planet called Wasp-12b, though, that's sort of egg-shaped, right? So I think that's pretty cool because it's really hot. It goes around its star almost, you know, once a day. And because it's so hot, it's actually tidally locked and it's getting stretched. So not only do you have this planet that's like an egg, it's not perfectly spherical anymore, but it's actually giving off mass. And so we often find that planets can actually disintegrate a little bit and leave a torus of material from where they were. So you don't get a torus-shaped planet, but you have the leftovers in a torus, which is pretty cool. And what about the, was it a comet or an asteroid that looked like it was two spherical pieces stuck together? It looked like a, a dumbbell, like there were two. So you can get that, but it didn't, it didn't form that way. So it formed as two round things and then it sort of, and they then kind came of met. Together. I think that's the understanding of well, it. Well, so you can get all kinds of weird shapes in asteroids, um, and these smaller bodies, because it's one that you get up to being a planet when you have so much mass, then you're becoming round and forced to sort of circularize. Oh, because the smaller things have less mass? Yeah, they have less mass and gravity. Right. And so the rocks win. Whatever right. the rock is doing, <laughs> it stays that way. <laughs> well, I've got a couple of, there's a couple of questions here about habitability that I, I like to combine questions sometimes uh, if they're on a similar topics. So William Warren from Abingdon, Maryland says, what exactly defines a planet as potentially habitable? Is it just being in the habitable zone where liquid water could exist or should we consider atmospheric composition, magnetic fields, plate tectonics and more? Love it. And then also Sean Browning from Hood River, Oregon, when our star inevitably expands and consumes the inner solar system, what effects would that have on the remaining planets and what planets would fall into the new habitable zone? Ooh. Or would the expansion of the sun change the remaining planet's orbits or would the mass not change, therefore leaving the planets in the current orbit? So what makes a planet habitable and how will that change as the sun starts to I love it. swallow our worlds? No, that's such a good question. I mean, right now we use the term habitable zone, but really that should, you know, the long, you know, the asterisk, read the fine print should really be region around a star where liquid water may be possible um, and seen on the surface. So just because a planet is in the habitable zone, that just means it's the right distance from the star where liquid water could hopefully persist on the surface. So sometimes people talk about the distance from Venus to Mars because, you know, in the past, these looked different. But people use different definitions. And part of how we think about habitability on a planet is involving liquid water, right? Because that's what, you know, life on Earth uses today. Um, but there's so many other factors, right? So you need water, you need energy. So starlight, all that UV radiation is good stuff, right? makes the crops grow, but too much, and that's a problem. So if you've got, you know, the stellar wind and all kinds of stellar flares from your star coming and beating down on you, that's bad news. So you want just the right amount of um, energy. And then you, of course, need nutrients um, to make everything happen. So I think there were some questions in there about, you know, what happens as our star changes, right? And our relationship with our world is not the same. And I think you know, where the habitable zone is in the solar system today is not where it was in the past, and it's not where it'll be in the future, because it used to be a little closer into the sun. That's why Venus used to be wetter than it is today. You had more Earth-like conditions, and then, of course, you had this runaway greenhouse effect, and now it looks kind of hellish. And so in the future, we expect as the sun gets brighter and expands out, Mercury and Venus are actually going to be sucked into it and eaten up 
but um, we should be okay. But out by Saturn is going to look pretty good for habitability. So maybe Titan, you know, the moon around Saturn could have a good day because it's got a lot of methane in its atmosphere, kind of like early Earth. I heard this and I didn't believe it until I did the calculation that when the sun becomes a red giant and Earth is long gone, so is Mercury and Venus and Mars becomes uninhabitable as a hot zone, Pluto becomes a habitable place. Right. I, I heard this and I double checked it and it, it checks out. The, the numbers crunched correctly. They, crun <laughs> they crunched correctly to make a Pluto a place where we might all have to escape to survive. There'll probably be a picture of me at the immigration no entry <laughs> just you get you get taken into the second room aren't you going to be reconsidering your life choices at that point <laughs> we've, yeah. we've found some things you've said and we'd like to <laughs> ask you some more questions speaking of more questions ben grund from detroit michigan says i hear it sometimes said that our solar system is pretty atypical in its constituency is every solar system a snowflake or are there some common themes to their layouts oh i like that well, Good I mean, question. you were just talking about the debris disk with water ice. So we do have some snowflakes out there in other systems, quite literally. But I think the thing that we originally thought was that everything was like the solar system. And then we found all of these big planets like Jupiter close into their star, hot Jupiters, because they were easy to find. We discovered that actually they're nothing like the solar system. But over time, we're finding more elements that are pretty similar. So I think... That we can say that we are not, you know, totally unique, but totally dissimilar. So I like the snowflake analogy because I actually think that there's enough similarities and differences for it to work for us. Also, people just tell me I'm a special snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that you have exoplanets discovered all over the world, right? It's not just telescopes in one place. And so you have WASP, right, this wide angle search for planets that found exoplanets in its early days. And then they've souped up versions. There's Super WASP now. So I think there's even a Super WASP telescope in South Africa. They're all over the place. And this is just one of many. Many of them have awesome names, by the way, right? There's the Trappist ones um, that come out of mm. Belgium that are making these great discoveries. And then we can keep studying them both from the ground and in space. God, scientists love a contrite acronym. They, <laughs> not, nothing makes scientists happier than finding some acronym. When I was in college, there was a, some computer scientists. This is early days. Uh, before that was even a title. There was some program we were all using. And its acronym was MAGIC. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does that stand for? What is it? He says... Mnemonics are generally idiotic constructions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>